Good afternoon and welcome to today's electronic design webcast. Our topic today, three ways to make your system more robust, sponsored by AppNet and Maxim Integrated. I'm Bill Wong, Senior Content Director, Performance Design Engineering and Sourcing Group. To begin, let me explain how you can participate in today's presentation. First of all, if you have any technical difficulties during today's session, simply hit F5 to refresh your webcast console. If you need assistance solving common issues, please click on the yellow help icon below the slides. Additionally, we welcome your question during today's event. We will answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A session that will follow the main presentation, but please feel free to send in your questions at any time. To do so, simply type your questions into the question window on the side of your screen and hit the submit button. Also, please be aware that today's session is being recorded and will be available on the Electronic Design website within the next week. You'll be notified by email when the archive is available. Now let's meet today's speakers. Robert G is an executive business manager for ATE and product definer for serial interface transceivers for the core products group at Maxim Integrated. Mulong Gao joined Maxim Integrated in 2005 as a senior member of the technical staff and has designed many evaluation kits. You can learn more about our speakers by clicking on the speaker bio widget on your console toolbar. Now let me turn things over to our presenters. Gentlemen, the floor is yours. Thanks, Bill. Um, so in my portion of the presentation, I'll be talking about um, serial interface transceivers and why they're leaders um, in, in the industry for robustness. Specifically, I'm going to zero in on RS-45 transceivers and CAN transceivers. The layout of my presentation is going to be a real basic definition of a serial transceiver and then a quick introduction to uh, what makes Maxim uh, unique and leaders in the serial transceiver interface market. In terms of uh, robust performance and protection, I'll be going over uh, fault protection, ESC protection, and common mode range and, and what they are. And then I have a concluding uh, summary slide at the very end. So for serial transceivers, what is it? I mean, basically, it's a device that can transmit and receive uh, information between two different systems over a wired medium. Um, for RS-232, this is what basically put Maxim on the map. We, when we introduced the MAX-232, um, it was the first uh, RS-232 transceiver that had integrated the charge pump and the inverter. And, and since then, uh, all of our competition have been copying our part numbers because they perceive Maxim as a leader. Believe it or not, this standard was introduced in 1962, yet it still has um, a lot of legs left <laughs> in its uh, maturity cycle of, of, of its product life. Um, they're still being used today in, in many different applications where um, you use RS-232 ports for debugging, or even configuration. Um, they're used in many industrial uh, applications. For RS-45, this standard was introduced in 1983. Um, it is a differential uh, type of device where it takes a single-ended uh, signal and uh, transposes that to a differential where obviously you have a lot of advantages with a differential approach. Uh, being very immune to uh, electrical noise and the fact that you can send it over long distances. The RS-45 standard also calls out for uh, a multi-drop system, so you can have multiple nodes, whereas the RS-232 is really point-to-point, um, -point, right? And the 485, you're able to achieve uh, communication over very long distance. So for, you know, they call out, uh, you know, 4,000 feet, um, which is ideally suitable for a lot of applications like uh, process control where you need to communicate over long cable distances. 
Uh, RF-232 obviously is a lot shorter. Um, the, the standard basically calls out a 50 feet kind of maximum uh, range. Now for CAN transceivers, um, that was introduced in 1985, uh, primarily uh, generated by Robert Bosch Company, um, and that was um, targeted for the automobile, and so therefore that's why the, um, the distance that's called out in the standard is 40 meters. Um, Multi-drop system, very similar to 485, um, differential but slightly different, which I will go over in the next slide. So as I mentioned, uh, both the CAN uh, transceiver and the RS-45 transceiver, they take a single-ended signal and they make a differential. And as you can see from this slide, the, the differential approach is slightly different, but you get the same effect. Really good noise immunity, uh, especially in uh, noisy environments. So uh, no doubt, uh, you know, with a, uh, a CAN transceiver inside uh, an automobile, especially under the hood, you're going to be see a lot. You're going to be seeing a lot of uh, electrical noise. And then for the RS-45, same thing. Especially if you're in a factory automation environment, there are motors, there are other uh, equipment that could um, affect those uh, those signals. You can see on the driver's side, um, what the standard calls out is that um, in neat, if you look at the bottom left, it calls out for a, uh, a differential between one and a half and three volts on the dominant side. And then um, on, the, uh, on the opposite side, it's from 12 millivolts to about minus 120 millivolts, um, that is the recessive side. So then you can tell, you know, obviously what are your um, ones and zeros. In the CAN uh, transceiver talk language, um, it's known as opposite. Right, so when you enter in a one, it comes out as a zero uh, differentially. On the RS-45 side, um, the output driver, um, in order for it to be valid, um, needs to be uh, above that plus or minus one and a half volt um, and less than plus or minus five volt. Anywhere in between is considered um, not an RS-45 uh, standard, although it could possibly work in a system if, um, you know, if the design architecture um, does that intentionally, but most RS-45 transceivers are compliant uh, to this type of uh, output driver uh, specification. Now, if you were to look on the receive side, on the CAN transceiver, you can see that um, there is noise margin built in for, for both the CAN and 485, but basically to be interpreted as a dominant node, um, it needs to be above 900 millivolts and below 8 volts. On the recessive side, it's got to be lower than minus 500 millivolts and above minus 3 volts. Um, anywhere in between is considered um, undefined. And then on the 485 side, um, you just need to be outside of that plus or minus 200 millivolt window in order to be considered valid. So Maxim is the leader when it comes to serial transceivers, especially for um, the RS-232 and 485 and CAN transceivers listed below here. Um, we have a lot of innovation. And as I mentioned before, you know, MAX-232 was the first uh, RS-232 transceiver uh, that had integrated the charge pump as well as the, the inverter so that, um, you know, you don't need four separate power supplies for your RS-232 uh, transceiver. Uh, but we were also the first to integrate high ESD at plus or minus 15 kV for uh, RS-232. Uh, we had the first isolated RS-232 transceiver as well as um, incorporating an auto shutdown plus feature, um, which basically um, shuts down the device and draws only one microamp of current when there's either um, no activity on the receiver for more than 30 seconds 
or if the, actor, if the cable was actually disconnected for more than 30 seconds. Uh, Maxim also offers the highest speed uh, RS-232 transceiver at 3 megabit per second, as well as the highest fault protected RS-232 transceiver uh, rated at plus or minus uh, 70 volts. On the 45 and CAN side, um, we were the first to integrate a high ESD. We did take that to the next level uh, where we have uh, a rating of plus or minus 35 kV for a device that has a very wide uh, supply range from 3 to 5.5 volts. Um, first and also the highest to have fault protection um, at plus or minus 80 volts. Um, we also had a true fail-safe um, a feature that uh, comes in handy for a lot of applications where your, um, your output is either shorted or open, and, and therefore you, you want your receiver output uh, on your 45 to be in a known state, which is uh, a high state. Okay, so I'll be talking about fault protection. This is the first of three uh, robust features that we offer. So what is fault protection? So in, in many different applications, it could mean different things. Uh, but when it comes to serial transceivers, basically your data ports, whether um, you know, you're talking about RS-45, whether it's your AB line, or uh, whether you're talking about um, CAN transceivers, uh, you're talking about CAN-H and, and CAN-L, and um, basically, if you have someone accidentally shorting your local power supply to those data lines, um, your transceiver is going to be completely protected. There, there will not be a, let's say, catastrophic uh, failure um, because that is one of um, you know, things that could go wrong in, in the application. And then you know, once that communication is, is shut down, uh, then, you know, obviously that, trans that particular transceiver or node will need to be replaced in the field. And so having this over-voltage protection um, is a good way to really make your end equipment robust. So what are the causes for uh, over-voltage faults? Um, there are a few scenarios that, uh, that can occur in the field. Um, one obvious one is the fact that um, in the field you could have a, a miswire, right? So whether it's installation or whether you're swapping out equipment and um, you know, you're, you're wiring back to the terminal blocks um, in, of your equipment and you, you know, miswire. And so when you power things up, uh, you realize, oh, you know, I, okay, I realize that I've shorted my um, 24 volt power supply uh, to my data port. Uh, fortunately, your transceiver has, um, you know, a fault protection. If not, then obviously um, that transceiver would be damaged. Um, other scenarios that could um, cause like an over voltage or short from the power supply to your data ports would be the way you lay out your, your wiring, right? So, um, if you have a bundled wire and you make a 90 degree turn um, and it's, it's fairly sharp or even sharper than 90 degrees, uh, then over time the, the insulation of that wire could wear out um, and short with a, let's say, um, a 24 volt or even higher uh, power supply. The other, another cause of uh, an over voltage situation would be, you know, if you had heavy equipment or something that was um, generating a lot of heat, um, and that is in close proximity to your cabling, um, that could, you know, eventually break down again the the insulation layer, or through vibration um, wear out that that insulation layer, um, and so that you would have two conductors uh, shorting to each other would be the other uh, scenario that that would happen. So in terms of protecting your transceiver um, from those type of over-voltage um, situations, um, here we're using an RS-45 example 
um, with a scope shot that shows that it's meeting the R45 standard. And, you know, Zener diets could be one approach. And so one would think, um, okay, um, with the Zener diet approach, I know that uh, the advantage with Zener is that it's, you know, used as a uh, shunt element, right? But it won't, uh, let's say, start playing in, in, into your circuit until that um, reverse voltage is exceeded, right? So you, obviously you need to choose something um, that falls within this um, IV curve that I have here, right? So in this reverse breakdown region, you would obviously want to choose a, um, a voltage a breakdown level where it makes sense for your application. So for example, um, you know, if you know you have a 24 volt supply um, and you want to protect against that, then um, you want to choose something that will um, help, um, you know, divert that, uh, that voltage away from your system. And so basically, um, they would be tied to your data port line in this fashion. Um, but then you also want to add these, um, these resistors that would help limit the current because um, there could be a scenario where um, it could draw a lot of current and exceed the Zener diode's uh, power dissipation capability. And so you would have um, basically Zener diodes that would overheat and eventually fail, and that's not what you want. So these um, resistors that you add would, would help limit that. Um, but there is a scenario where, um, you know, by adding these Zener diodes, it, it, it may not work because, um, you know, fine, as long as your output differential is above um, zero volts, then you're okay. But if you look at this IV curve, if something was to go negative, right, on your, on your um, outputs of your data line, then it's going to be clipped because typically Zener diodes, they have a, a forward voltage uh, bias of about, you know, 0 0.3 to 0 0.7 volts, and that would clip your signal. And so that's not ideal. And, um, and so you would go, and as I'm going to this next slide, you would arrange something like this, uh, which is as you can see, quite elaborate. And so here is a, a full duplex RS45 transceiver. And basically on the driver side, you would have to generate a driver logic um, circuit that would go into an H-bridge. And what that would do was basically ensure that your uh, differential signal is going to be above um, that zero volt. And so um, that's going to play in a, in a way that the Zener diodes are, are not going to be clipping um, your, your signal. Now, um, you know, obviously going from a half duplex to a full duplex, adding the driver circuitry and this H-bridge um, is going to be, you know, a, a little bit more than, than maybe what you bargained for, right? So, you know, obviously in terms of upside, you're going to be uh, maintaining that RS45 differential. Um, you're, going to be, you're going to have some current limit um, and over voltage protection. Uh, but on the downside, right, there's definitely more design time uh, for both the driver and H-bridge. And then you're moving from a half duplex to a full duplex. So now you're talking about a part that's a little pricier and bigger. So you're going to occupy more space, and it's probably going to cost a lot more. Um, with with a Maxim transceiver that has fault protection, that, that's built in. And so we have the highest fault protected uh, transceiver in the marketplace at plus or minus 80 volts. And that comes in real handy for a lot of applications where there's a lot of technician that are working on equipment and there's always that chance of accidental uh, miswiring, um, especially in the field. And so here's just an example of one device that has that plus or minus 80 volts of fault protection. This is the Max 13442E as well as the, the 13444E. Um, it's got the standard um, RS45 pinout in the standard package. It's rated up to 125 degrees C so that you're able to put it into very harsh uh, environments. 
Um, it's got uh, plus or minus 15 kilovolts of ESD, but really the standout feature here is the plus or minus 80 volts of, of fault protection. So now I'll be going over um, ESD protection. So electrostatic discharge, um, this is basically a, uh, a swift discharge of electric current between two objects with different uh, charges. And so when they exchange uh, electrons, you know, there could be a chance of uh, a catastrophic failure or even latent failure, which is something that's, um, you know, really difficult to, let's say, um, understand kind of like the cause of the, uh, the ESD, when it happened, where in your IC did it happen until much, much later, um, you know, if you're fortunate enough to, um, to have a, a really good FA um, an analysis lab to, to really investigate. But, but really latent failures or infant mortality are, are those uh, type of failures that are really difficult to deal with. And so electrostatic discharge is something that, that's real and that could happen in the field and uh, something that you need to protect your uh, transceivers with. The different types of uh, ESD, uh, as I laid out here, are the human body model, the uh, contact where it's actually equipment, touching equipment, and then you have air gap where that discharge occurs when you're not necessarily touching. So the, the spec calls out for about one centimeter uh, distance and you can see that they all share very similar uh, waveforms, right? So that is uh, a measurement of uh, current versus, um, I'm sorry, voltage versus uh, time. So you can see that they have an initial rise time, and then with contact and air gap, they have a secondary, um, uh, let's say, peak uh, in their waveform. And so for Human body modeled, um, we're talking about nanoseconds here, um, but in, in contact and air gap, uh, we're talking along more microseconds. Um, contact, the, the first peak is, is, is what we're looking at, and for air gap, it's actually that secondary peak is what we're looking at. Now, if you look at the uh, standard a little closer, you can see that um, they have different classifications. Um, one through four, and you can see that there's different voltage ratings um, up to class four, and there is a, let's say, a class X where you can claim higher uh, human body model uh, performance, um, but, and that's all extrapolate, uh, extrapolated linearly. And so um, the same goes with uh, contact and air gap. You can see their respective levels, and, um, you know, with, with maxim uh, transceivers, we, we oftentimes uh, go beyond the, the highest rating of, uh, of a class or a level four. Um, when or where does uh, ESD happen? Um, one of three areas, you know, when you um, handle the parts and you, you're not taking precautions with uh, ESD such as, um, you know, not wearing um, your ESD strap when you're working on a board, or uh, you're, you're you know, handling the material itself in general, or you don't you're not, you don't have ESD uh, rated uh, mass on the floor. Um, the other situation could be on the production floor, where you know you may have to do rework and you're not careful um, when there's human interface or um, other equipment, as well as especially in the field where we see most of the ESD uh, damage. And that could be due to, uh, you know, maintenance work technicians um, installing or, um, you know, changing out equipment in the field. So how do you protect, um, you know, ESD uh, occurrences? Mainly through TVS diodes. And as you can see here, the, uh, the IV curve here is actually very similar um, to the Zener. Uh, and this would be the unidirectional uh, TVS uh, diode. And as you can see, um, I, I've noted the, the clamping voltage, which is uh, basically needs to be lower than um, your 
your, your maximum application uh, voltage that's being applied. You have a voltage um, breakdown, right? And then you have a, uh, a working voltage, uh, which is basically when that uh, TVS diode would, would shut off. Now with a, uh, a bidirectional TVS diode, which is uh, most commonly used, now you can see that um, you have that symmetrical um, waveform or IV curve so that um, you don't have to worry about the, the other side, right? So, um, or worry about clipping uh, the signal, as I mentioned earlier with, with the Zener diodes. So this is how you would uh, implement that on your transceiver. You can see that uh, in both uh, line A and line B, that would be tied to ground and you have something in between them. And so that would protect um, your uh, data ports and considerations that you need to uh, take is that uh, for your working voltage, you need to make sure that is uh, larger than your uh, normal operating voltage range uh, in your application. And then as I mentioned, uh, the, the clamp voltage needs to be lower than your absolute max uh, voltage rating of your transceiver. Um, otherwise, you know, the Zeners won't uh, act in a way to protect your the ports of your transceiver. That needs to be lower than that, that uh, max rating. And then, um, you know, make sure that your peak pulse power is also, um, for your TVS diode, also greater than your projected transient, um, the expected transient for, for your application. Um, and so with Maxim, we, we do all that inside of our transceivers. And here's one example. It's the MAX14780. It's a half-duplex RS45 transceiver that is um, all integrated. So um, in many applications, um, you don't need to have an external TVS diode to withstand um, th that type of ESD strikes um, from, from, the, from the outside onto your data port lines. And lastly, I'll talk about the common mode range. Um, what is it? It basically, um, your common mode range, uh, at least specifically for RS45, it's rated from minus 7 to plus 12 volts. That means your signal, which is referenced to ground, can move between a minus 7 to plus 12 volts, right? So the common mode voltage here is the voltage of, uh, the difference of, the voltage of your outputs uh, divided by two. For CAN transceivers, it's, uh, it's a more shallow uh, window. It's minus two volts to plus seven volts. But modern day transceivers go beyond what's shown in the standard. Um, few causes for a high common mode range. Um, but primarily it's different ground planes, right, from one system to another. And that can occur when you're communicating um, from one system to another, and they're different buildings, and they have different power transformers, that, and, and that could cause um, a, a difference uh, in, in terms of uh, that common mode. Um, also, if you have local equipment that's injecting electrical noise that's affecting uh, not only earth ground, but also um, if you're using a cable that's unshielded, uh, that could be easily influenced. And so, you know, a lot of times in Asia they want to save money um, and then they're using a lower quality cable. Uh, that common mode can happen because of that reason. Uh, one way to address this could be isolation, right? So um, we do offer uh, isolated transceivers, um, but things that you need to be careful about is um, you know, as soon as you use uh, anything isolated, you have to be aware of choosing the right one, right? So you have to take in consideration um, the over-voltage category of the application, what your creepage and clearance requirements are. There's a pollution degree element to it, as well as a material group uh, piece where that's the rating of the uh, epoxy packaging itself. And then, you know, if you want to have an isolated system, then um, you know you have to uh, 
take note of which safety standard you're going after. Uh, and if you do want to have your system um, you know, certified, there is a cost behind that as well as a lead time. Or um, you can use a device, if, if the application does not require protection, you can use a device that has high common mode range already built in. And this uh, family of CAN transceivers is, is an example of that um, in the MAX 13053A, 54A, um, where it has plus or minus 25 volts of common mode range, which means one side could be uh, minus 25 volts, the other side could be zero volts. You would still be able to receive that signal from, from the transmitter from another system, um, which is a huge advantage because sometimes um, you know, as I mentioned, isolation can be used for uh, level translating and protection. Uh, this common, high common mode range kind of does that, does level transla translation, but, not necessarily, but it doesn't cover the uh, protection part of it. But if your system does not require um, that, let's say, uh, safety or protection feature, then um, a part with high common mode range really comes in handy. Um, so in summary, uh, Maxim offers um, a very large portfolio. Um, we have the, the most robust um, serial transceiver that's offered in the market today. Um, and if you want to increase the reliability of your end equipment, we have devices that have high, the highest fault protection, highest ESD protection, high common mode range. And with all those features integrated into a transceiver, you could save um, it definitely costs with um, you know, lower design or less design time. Um, and then in terms of uh, space on your PC board, there, there's uh, a cost savings there as well as minimizing on, on your bomb count. And so if you, you know, have an application with your end customer um, that requires robust features, we, we actually offer a, a lot, a lot of parts that uh, cover many, many different applications. So that's it with um, steel transceivers and, and the, the robustness that we offer from Maxim. Um, I'll hand this time over to uh, Mulan. Thank you, Bob. My name is Mulan Gao. I'm a product designer at Maxim Integrated. Today, I'm going to talk about supervisor and uh, Maxim Ideal Diode Controller. First, I'm going to talk about the supervisor and why is it needed in our system. I will introduce several different types of supervisors and the design challenge they resolve. Mainly, there are four types of supervisors. They are supply voltage supervisors, power supply sequencers, watchdog timers, switch debunkers or push button on off controllers. I'm also going to talk about the Maxim Idea Diode Controller, Max 16141. So supervisor defend against system failure. Supervisors can serve as a system safety net and the supervisors also help maintain system, reliab system reliability in the face of a real-world force. Anything happens that unexpected, you should use a supervisor to defend your system. What's a supervisor? A supervisor can take several forms and are known by several names. We call supervisor reset or reset IC. We also call supervisor voltage monitors or voltage detectors. The third name for supervisors are sequencers. And finally, watchdog or watchdog timer are also supervisors. And push button debunker nowadays are also 
in the category of supervisors. So, what are supervisor common characteristics or their common traits? Supervisors monitor something that is critical to a system's operation, like a supply voltage, like a heartbeat, like a push button, etc. When supervisors detect what they are looking for, they take some action to ensure system proper operation. Supervisors are independent. Most of the functions could be performed by, for example, a microcontroller and an ADC. But if a system fault makes the micro or other components unable to perform properly, they may not be able to recover. So supervisors detect special conditions and, where possible, help the system respond to them in the best possible way. Now I'm going to talk about the first category of supervisors, supply voltage supervisors also called reset ICs, voltage monitors, or voltage detectors. Micro wants to be disabled in reset state for some period after supply become active. A microcontroller also wants to be disabled when power supply is below the voltage threshold at any time during operation. So in this picture, we show a microcontroller. And during power up and power down, the microcontroller should be disabled. How we do that? We use a supervisor. Traditionally, a simple RC filter can do the supervisor job, but a simple RC filter has problem. It needs the power supply always starts and stops quickly with no voltage errors. But common supply problems are ignored and can result in system misbehavior or failure. So that's why an RC filter is not reliable for modern microcontroller system. And a supervisor or a supervisor IC or reset IC are optimized for this function. They avoid the problems associated with simple RC filters. So in this picture, you can see there is a supervisor IC in front of the microcontroller. So it monitors the voltage supply of the system and generates a reset output to the microcontroller in case the power supply has a faulty condition, and it generates reset output to the microcontroller during power up and power down time. There are several specs to consider when you choose a supervisor. The major two specs are threshold voltage and timeout period. Select the threshold voltage to be greater than the minimum operating voltage of the microprocessor or microcontroller. It should also be less than the minimum output voltage of the power supply. Select the timeout period to be greater than the minimum value 
specified for the microprocessor or microcontroller. We also consider the manual reset input. This allows a reset to be initiated by either a push button or by a system logic signal. Reset output configuration should be also considered. Often, open drain, active low are the most popular reset output, but systems have different requirements. So many supervisors are available with push-pull and or active-high output options as well. The next step we should consider is the input channel cut. Some systems require monitoring of multiple power supply voltages. So the supervisor needs to have enough input channels to accommodate this requirement. Supply voltage supervisors have potential issues. At very low voltage levels, the supervisor is not working and the reset output is in undefined state. So, you need to be sure the valid, you need to be sure the supervisor is valid before the micro wakes up. This is a common issue for the supervisors at the market. And Maxim has a native technology to solve this issue. Stay tuned and you will know the product very soon. And Maxim will be released this time, uh, this product in about one year. Another problem with the supervisor or issue with a super, uh, supervisor is that when VCC or power supply is noisy, the supervisor should not be affected by this noise. And uh, if the noise is really big, really large, you need to clean up the power supply before the system is affected. The next category of supervisor is the power supply sequencers. So power supplies usually need to be enabled in a specific order. They often need a delay between supplies powering up. In this picture, we show a very simple way to insert a delay between two power supplies. So this is a 5 volt supply and 3.3 volt supply. There is a delay between these two supplies and it's implemented by a reset IC. But when you have multiple supplies, a dedicated sequencer will be needed. The sequencer will control the start up of the power supplies. Sequencers often include reset functions and other functions as well. And sequencers can power down they supply in a reverse order of the power up sequence. This is the timing diagram of a typical sequencer. Basically, 
there are two major sequencers. The first type has the order of powering up sequence and also has the reverse order for powering down. The second type of sequencer only has the power up sequencer but don't have the power down sequencer. So when the system is powered down, all the supplies are shut down at the same time. This may be not ideal for some systems. So the first type of sequencer is more popular on the market. That is, with both power up and power down sequencing. There are other major features for a typical sequencer. First, the threshold. The threshold can be set by a resistor. Second, there is a channel count consideration for a sequencer. You need one single channel or multiple channel sequencing. The third feature of a sequencer is timing. The delay time is configured by external capacitors or it can be preset by the factory. Then the driving capability of the sequencer. Should the sequencer directly output drive the enable input of a DC DC module, or the output should drive a MOSFET, external MOSFET? Then we have another feature to consider the discharge, quick discharging capability. Some sequencers have active capacitor discharging that can quickly discharge the energy at the downstream system. Some sequencers have reset output, and uh, some sequencers have over-voltage uh, detection, over-voltage detection also. Now, I'm going to move to the third category of supervisors, watchdog timers, or watchdogs.
just in case any of you have uh, come up with some new questions, uh, you can type your question into the question window on the side of your screen and hit the submit button. We'll be answering questions uh, after we wrap up here. In addition, we'll be responding via email to any questions that we can't get to during the Q&A session. Uh, likewise, there is a feedback form at the bottom of your screen. Sorry, I think there were some technical issues in the several minutes before. And I'm going to start uh, the third category of supervisors, watchdog timers. So watchdog timers, also called watchdogs, are different from resets in, the, in that they are looking for code failures. The source of these failures can be from software errors or hardware errors, including bits being flipped by cosmic rays. The premise is this. If a microprocessor or microcontroller starts to run a piece of code that it can't exit from, a watchdog can detect this condition and generate a hardware signal to set the micro back to the right path. The signal can trigger a non-maskable interrupt to allow the microcontroller or microprocessor to escape the loop it's stuck in, or it can trigger a full reset of the micro. The choice depends on system requirements. The latter is more disruptive, but it's also generally more reliable. How does a watchdog decide that there is a problem? By monitoring an output on the micro. The micro must generate a pulse within a specified period of time. Otherwise, the watchdog will determine that there is a code failure and will generate an interrupt or reset. Some watchdogs require the heartbeat pulses to occur within a window of time that is more than a minimum period and less than a maximum period. These are called windowed watchdogs.
So this is the first step of detecting the fault. And after a fault is detected, a watchdog will send a signal to the microcontroller to reset or to send an unmaskable interrupt to the microprocessor. The microprocessor then takes whatever action needed to recover the system. This is the timing diagram of a watchdog and reset. So typically, after the system is powered up and working in normal mode, the watchdog is listening signals from a microcontroller. If the microcontroller doesn't send a signal to the watchdog input within the minimum timeout period, the watchdog output will generate a watchdog output to the microcontroller. The signal can either be a general purpose I.O. input to the microcontroller or a reset input to the microcontroller. A watchdog output can also initiate a reset to the microcontroller or microprocessor by connecting the watchdog output to the manual reset input of the watchdog. The watchdog can generate a reset based on the watchdog input. So this is the timing diagram of a watchdog output that generates a reset. So basically, output, a watchdog output is asserted first, and then because the watchdog output is connected to the watchdog manual reset input, so the manual reset input asserts. Once manual reset input asserts, the reset output will assert. So the system will be reset. There are other major features a watchdog can have. So the first one should be manual reset input. Whether the system needs a manual reset input. The second is watchdog and reset timing configuration. How the system is going to configure the watchdog time, timeout period and reset time period. It can be configured by external capacitors or it can be preset by the factory. The third feature of a watchdog uh, IC is the reset output. Usually, we integrate a reset output in the watchdog IC. Now, I'm moving to the last category of supervisors. We call them switch debunkers or push button on off controllers. So, a debunker is solving some problems with real world switches, mechanical switches. The problem with mechanical switches is that they bounce. 
logic circuits like to see very clear, nice, well-behaved logic inputs. When you press on a push-button switch, the output isn't well-behaved. The switch contacts bonds and make contact multiple times before finally stabilizing. So that's the problem. You don't want the switch bounce to create multiple signals to the system. You want a single signal, usually a pulse, that the system can use. A debouncer also solves another problem, that is the high voltage interference from the outside world or ESD from mechanical or human body or any outside uh, circuits or components. So the debouncer will isolate those high voltage, high voltages or ESDs from the microcontroller system to avoid the microcontroller system being damaged. Maxim has a nanopower debouncer that serves as battery freshening field. So this Max 16150A or 16150B nanopower debouncer is a 20 nanoamp standby current device. It can serve as a battery freshening field before the push button is, can, is pressed, the system power is cut off. A short press applies the power to the downstream microcontroller, and a long press removes the power from the downstream system. So it will save power to the system. This is the summary of the supervisors. Majorly, basically, there are four major types. Reset or voltage monitor, voltage detector. Second is sequencer. The third one is the watchdog timer. And the last one is the push button controller or on-off controller. So Maxim has a very comprehensive and broad portfolio of supervisors. And Maxim has very high quality and high performance supervisors on the market. It's very, uh, it saves system design time and saves system cost. Lastly, I'm going to introduce Maxim Ideal Diode Controller, Max 16141. Max 16141 addresses common design challenges for a lot of systems. It solves six or it protects, it provides six major protections to a system. So on this diagram, we can, oh sorry. On this diagram, on this diagram, we are showing how Max 16141 protect a system. We have
Okay, so six kind of protections are reverse current protection, short circuit or overcurrent protection, high voltage transient protection, and thermal damage protection. The ideal diode controller can also provide under voltage protection and reverse voltage protection. So you can go to Maxim website and type in Max16141 to search the device and find the details of the device. And thank you. As noted, a few of you have submitted questions, so we're going to jump right in. Again, if you'd like to submit a question, type your question into the side of your screen and hit the Submit button. While we're answering your questions, please complete the feedback form, which is located at the bottom of the screen. So, CAN is typically used for automotive applications. What other applications could we use CAN for? For CAN applications, uh, they're heavily used in the industrial space, and so they can be used in, let's say, backplane communication. They've been used in uh, drone applications, um, especially elevator control is just uh, to name a few, but um, for sure there, there are plenty of industrial applications that are obviously not automotive. Okay. How are CAN and RS485 different from standard interface ICs? Um, really, the CAN and RS485, um, they're, they're meant to um, communicate over longer distances. I'm assuming that standard uh, interface IC would, would be, you know, something where along the lines of I2C or SPI where, you know, the distances are, are not as long and you're talking from one component to another rather than talking from one system to another. Okay. Well, that concludes today's presentation. On behalf of Electronic Design, I'd like to thank Avnet and Maxim Integrated for sponsoring today's event, and of course, to all of you for joining us. Have a great rest of the day.